I welcome everybody to this, um, the first of a series of events taking place um, for the organization called National Alliance of Women's Organizations and the UK Civil Society Women's Association. And they are co-sponsoring um, this event, which is an event being um, put forward by uh, EBBF, Ethical Business Building the Future. And the title of this event is Sustainable Deve Development as a Business Value. And we welcome you all. There may be some more people coming um, as we go through. Let me just tell you a little bit about EBBF. It was established in 1990. And it is a Baha'i-inspired global learning community that accompanies mindful individuals and groups through their daily work and discourse to transform business and the economy, and thereby contributing to a prosperous, just, and sustainable civilization. So no major task there, all very simple. Um, we have um, this community of about, I don't know how many people, but it's made up of both women, men, and young people as well in over 50 countries. And uh, we are a very diverse group of people all of whom hold to a set of seven values, uh, which we believe are the ethical principles that should sustain businesses, societies, and communities everywhere. So we, we have uh, four speakers today, and we also have one discussant. Um, our speakers are um, Dr. Arthur Lyon Dahl, um, and I will introduce them each individually but now I'll just give you the list of names. Uh, Maya Graf, uh, Safa Sadek, and Fiona Young. And our discussant is Ellie Hollingworth. This um, event is also sponsored and, and done in conjunction with the uh, now, was, now was the National Alliance of Women's Organizations, Young Women's Alliance. It's a system whereby uh, young people at Stroud High School mostly, but in many other places as well here in the UK are enabled to participate in United Nations events by not, you know, by learning to follow the um, CSW uh, discussions and the documents, but also by presenting to audiences um, to give them the experience as young leaders themselves. And, and hopefully, and they usually do a wonderful job, and I'm sure that Safa's going to do a wonderful job for us today. So welcome to everyone who's just joined. We are recording, so if you want to not be involved in the recording, keep your um, yourself blanked out um, on the screen. I'd first like to introduce Dr. Arthur Lyon Dahl. He is president of the International Environment Forum and he is also a board member of EBBF. He is the retired Deputy Assistant Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program, known as UNEP. And he's worked on issues of sustainable development since before the term was invented. And I can vouch for that because I think, Arthur, you were at the 1972 conference in Stockholm, were you not? Uh, UN conference on uh, on the environment. Yes. He is an environmental scientist by training. He specializes in small islands and coral reefs. He lived and worked for many years in the Pacific Islands and in Africa before settling in Switzerland, where guess what? There are no coral reefs. <laughs> Unusual the choice. Fossil but coral course. reefs, but <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh, yes. And he was, of course, working for the United Nations there. He's been a lifelong member of the Baha'i faith. He's interested in the relationship between science and values. He's published many scientific papers and books, including The Eco Principle, Ecology and Economics in Symbiosis, In Pursuit of Hope, A Guide for the Seeker, and with Augusto Lopez Cleros and Maya Graf, who's also on this program. Uh, a book entitled Global Governance and the Emergence of Global Institutions for the 21st Century. So, Arthur, over to you. Well, 
Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. And uh, I'd like to sort of launch our discussion of sustainable development as well by saying we have to look at sustainable development as something that is, I might say, challenging the whole business paradigm in which we're living today. So we're really looking here at something that's quite fundamental in terms of what values does this concept bring into our, our thinking about business. If we look at the latest definition of sustainable development, you might say, you could probably say it is the 2030 agenda the United Nations adopted in 2015 with its sustainable development goals. And so you have 17 goals, 160, 69 targets under the goals and many indicators and so on. But it's a quite complete mapping of sustainability across issues of poverty and health and education, the environment and the oceans and inequality and you know, urbanism, all the different dimensions are all included within that framework of what's going to be required to move towards sustainability. And when that was being launched in 2015, Secretary General of the United Nations said that this agenda was calling for a fundamental transformation in society and the economy. The Sustainable Development Goals defined a paradigm shift for people and planet, inclusive and people-centered, leaving no one behind, integrating the economic, social, and environmental dimensions in a spirit of solidarity, cooperation, and mutual accountability, with the participation of governments and all stakeholders. And of course, business are one of those stakeholders. And when you think about those points, you know, how well does business today you know, apply all of those concepts? You know, is there a spirit of solidarity and cooperation? Uh, or does it integrate in the social, environmental, yeah, and economic dimensions? Is it inclusive and people-centered? You know, we're really, there's a far, the big gap between the way most businesses practice today and the goals are set out by the governments of the world and accepted you know, globally at the national level. <clears throat> also, since we have youth involved, Secretary General also said, young people will be the torchbearers, the first truly globalized, interconnected and highly mobilized civil society, ready and able to serve as a participant, joint steward and powerful engine of change and transformation. So in a sense, this business value is calling for change. So how does, what kind of change is implied when we look at this in, in, in the business context? And of course, if you take a concept like leaving no one behind, which of course is at the core of that 2030 agenda, that includes women and other marginalized groups. You know, they all need to be involved. Uh, and of course, we know with equal opportunity, they can certainly do you know, much better than we're doing at the present time where most of the world functioning only half of the human population, the male half. And in fact, if we look at what's behind that, of course, education is the key to that part of transformation. And the Baha'i International Community said a few years ago, education must be lifelong. It should help people to develop the knowledge, values, attitudes, and skills necessary to earn a livelihood and contribute confidently and constructively to shaping communities that reflect principles of justice, equity and unity. So here again, business is very much involved in livelihoods and so building and shipping communities. <clears throat> it should also help the individual develop a sense of place and community, grounded in the local, but embracing the whole world. Successful education will cultivate virtue <clears throat> as the foundation for personal and collective well-being, and will nurture in individuals a deep sense of service and an active commitment to the welfare of their families the communities, their countries, indeed, all mankind. So again, you know, how much is business involved in that process of making certain that every human being is educated with the skills necessary to contribute in that, one, that way to society and adv help advance our needs at, at all levels? So when looked then at the economy, which is, of course, what business is all about, it should really be serving well-being beyond just GDP or, or profit as, as, as the main goal or, or aim of business. And in fact, by community has said, the aim should be a dynamic, just and thriving social order, strongly altruistic and cooperative in nature, providing meaningful employment and helping to eradicate poverty in the world. Now imagine if business was really saying, what can we do to be altruistic and cooperative? How can we provide employment for everybody, every human being, you know, has a right to be able to work and to contribute to society and eradicate poverty in the world. 
All of these should be part of how we rethink the economic system with that transformation called for in the Sustainable Development Goals. <clears throat> so business value really should, value should be a social purpose. Profit should just be one measure of efficiency among others. Clearly, this is losing money all the time is not going to survive. But once it is reasonably profitable, then other things, other purposes should be the, the central focus of business. Yet if you look at business today, the main, is the main driver of unsustainability in the world. It's actually going in the wrong direction and producing you know, injustice and inequality around the world. And in fact, studies have shown if business incorporated in its you know, accounting, all the social and environmental externalities, all of its impacts on the climate and so on and so forth, no sector today would be profitable you know, in, in the way that it's functioning at the present time. And just think of all the things that business is doing wrong. You've got, it's not reducing poverty, it's in fact trapping the poor with junk foods and so on as, as food for the poor to make more money. You've got the military industrial complex wasting enormous resources in every country. The fossil fuel industry, which knew about climate change in the middle 1960s and is blithely going ahead and making, maximizing its profits, knowing very well it was destroying the climate and upsetting the climate balance. Industrial agriculture, with all of heavy use of pesticides and destroying the soil. FAO says we have 60 harvests left before the food system will collapse around the world from industrial agriculture at the rate we're going now. Transportation running on fossil fuels with individual vehicles. You know, SUVs are the most profitable choice and therefore they're out marketing them. We have advertising develop excessive consumption. Of the, you know, the whole consumer society is based on selling us more and more. There's the use of addictions. Well, obviously, the addiction to drugs is one thing. Alcohol and tobacco are known to be addictive. Gambling, the social media are addictive. You know, every time you, you like something on Facebook or send a tweet, it triggers the same pleasure center of the brain as cocaine. And they know very well to increase advertising revenues, getting people in there, clicking more and more, because that's part of the business model. We look at the, the pharmaceutical industry producing vaccines for profit, selling them to the wealthy countries and ignoring the needs of the poor parts of the world and using intellectual property as a way of trapping benefit themselves of research that was funded by, by, by public funding. And of course, then intellectual property is another area where knowledge has been privatized, science has been privatized, uh, genetic resources have been privatized, the World Trade Organization, you know, have been try, were trying, you know, people trying to, to free the, to, you know, the vaccines we use around the world, but the wealthy countries fight against it. They don't want to yield anything intellectual property because that's the part of the business model. Maybe this is a, as a scientist, I cannot even consult the scientific literature without paying thirty-five or forty dollars to read a single paper, because it's all been captured by you know, multinational publishing houses doing it all for profit. I wrote a paper for a book a few years ago, and after we all submitted our papers, they said, you know, thank you for your papers. You cannot give more than the first five pages to anybody without paying for it. So they took all of our intellectual knowledge and made it into their own private property for their profit. We have to hold the financial system with, based on, on excessive speculation, tax evasion, tax-free havens. You know, I could go on and on with all of the, the, the unsustainability of various parts of the business sector. You know, and even the wealthy owners that may complain about this, you know, America maintains Delaware as a place where you're going to have secrecy, secrecy in corporations. You know, the UK has the Channel Islands. You know, even the wealthy countries have, have some little corner where business can hide things and you know, hide or, or use transfer pricing to move money around the world. So you know, we're, we're dealing with a very sick business system that's totally contrary to the whole aim of sustainable development. And like, the, the, he the dropped it. And I was just like, Not to mention lobbying and corruption. And just to conclude, goal. there's a recent scientific study, part of the scientists warning about the problems we were facing with unsustainability, in which they said the most significant impact on the environment and sustainability comes from the wealthy and our society of abundance. Our materialistic consumption is not compensated by advances in technology. The only way we can avoid the climate and biodiversity catastrophes is through a significant reduction in our lifestyle and GDP in Western economies, with all the losses in employment and changes in our economic model that this implies. We must rethink our communities from the bottom up and simplify our ways of living. Now, giving that message to the business community 
and to the economic system. You know, this is you can see you can see what radical transfer paradigm shift means if you want to move towards sustainability and not keep going in the wrong direction. So business value means to rethinking the whole purpose of business and finding new models that respond to this social purpose. Some companies are starting. We have the B Corporation movement, social enterprises, people are experimenting. So there's some move in the right direction, but a long ways to go before we begin to move towards sustainability in business. So sorry to depress you, but I think when you look at business you know, and sustainability, we, really, we have to change so many things to start going in the right direction. So thank you very much. And I hope I'll stimulate some conversation afterwards with all of you present. Thanks so much, Arthur. Really appreciate it. It is a bit of a depressing picture, but you know, many of us are here to try to change that. And these are some of the things that we'll be discussing later. So thanks for kicking us off. I'd like now to introduce our next speaker, who is Maya Groff. She's an international lawyer based in The Hague, assisting in the development and serving, servicing of multilateral treaties. She's also working on various um, international criminal tribunals, and some of us will know this, um, the International um, Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and others. She's teaching at the Hague Academy of International Law, and she is currently a visiting professor at Leiden University. She has worked on a wide range of existing and potential global treaties, addressing contemporary human issues, human rights issues, and cross-border border legal cooperation, including the pioneering International Hague Network of Justice, of judges. She regularly conducts liaison work with international organizations, international professional associations, NGOs, and has played a key role in the convening of international legal experts uh, and their groups for the purpose of developing new international legal norms. She's drafted a wide range of international legal policy documents and published academically on private and public international law, human rights, and global governance. She holds degrees from McGill uh, in civil law and common law and Oxford and Harvard universities, and is an attorney admitted to the practice in the state of New York. Formerly, she was working in corporate law. She has served on the international law and UN committees of um, the New York City Bar Association and the advisory boards of B Corp, which was just mentioned in Europe, and EBBF. Uh, all of these are organizations devoted to ethical business. She, along with Arthur Dahl and um, uh, Augusto Lopez Cleros, uh, were the joint winners of the 2018 New Shape Prize for Global Governance Innovation and is a co-author of the 2020 book mentioned already, Global Governance and the Emergence of Global Institutions for the 21st Century, which is published by Cambridge University Press. So welcome, Maya. Thank you, Wendy. And I'm very embarrassed to have uh, all that information read at such an informal <laughs> gathering. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was assuming it would just be for background info. Um, but yes, lovely to be here with you all to discuss this really important topic as Arthur has laid out <laughs> uh, some of the very dire conditions we're, we're now living in, in terms of business and uh, sustainable development. And so just to underline and to echo again what Arthur th said about this really incredible agenda, of course, we have the 2030 agenda uh, and the SDGs adopted in 2015. And they are uh, an incredible milestone, not just for businesses in the private sector, which are mentioned you know, at various parts throughout uh, the document, the SDGs, but also because it is a consensus document uh, adopted by uh, all heads of state, all governments of the world, which is really remarkable in terms of a milestone in our, in our global governance. But of course, uh, the reason why we don't have them implemented, there's a number of reasons, but of course they are not enforceable. <laughs> there is no uh, strong one international court which can oversee and implement these goals. They weren't uh, uh, supposed to be binding. Uh, so of course you, you see the huge global governance gap just in, in trying to take a first look at these this very important sustainable development agenda. 
and how it will apply to businesses and other actors. So that's just a structural issue, which we address in, in the book uh, that, that Wendy mentioned. Um, but we are where we are where we are today. So despite those weaknesses in terms of you know, a, a proper instrument, which can really uh, specifically guide business and state activity, the SDGs are an amazing opportunity for businesses uh, because they do present a global framework uh, on sustainable development. They, they, they show, you know, different, uh, they have a long-term horizon where businesses can, can, can develop strategies, policies, channel investments, and uh, present a common language where businesses can discuss with governments, with each other around uh, the, the, the SDGs. And uh, there's been a lot of very uh, interesting uh, assessment frameworks like SDG Compass and others to help com companies, those companies who want to, of course, it's a voluntary effort to try to implement the SDGs. Um, and just to also echo what Arthur was saying about how crucial the private sector and businesses are in, in terms of achieving uh, um, sustainable development, uh, one statistic is that there are 60% of the 150 biggest economies in the world are private companies. So just let that sink in. 60% of the 150 biggest economies in the world are private companies, <laughs> you know, rather than nation states. So those are the big multinationals, obviously, or, or big national corporations. Um, and you can just imagine the resources, logistical capacity, and or emissions, climate emissions that these these companies uh, uh, add up to. Uh, but it, when we're talking about sustainable uh, development as a business value, we also can't forget uh, SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, which are addressed in the SDGs, and in emerging economies, represent about 90% of the labor force and and economic activity. So. The business sustainable development and business challenge is really uh, every every business actor, but those business actors are not all created equal. Um, also, I just wanted to mention that the definition of sustainable development, of course, in the SDGs and modern definitions is very uh, multifaceted. Um, the SDGs mention, you know, the goal to realize the human rights of all and achieve gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. Uh, and they speak of economic, social, and environmental uh, uh, development. So again, this is a multifaceted, integrated kind of vision, uh, which, as Arthur was mentioning, is really about a holistic transformation of, of our societies. Um, and in terms now of, of the business case, yes, we still have a lot of bad behaviors, very bad uh, uh, infrastructures or lack of infrastructures, for example, tax evasion and, and all sorts of, of, of different uh, business behaviors that are badly regulated. But at this point in time, the, the business case now for having sustainability as a core business value is, is, is very persuasive. For example, to be a first mover and to enter new markets for, for green goods where there's, there's increasing consumer demand, uh, companies can cut costs and become more prof profitable and energy efficient. Uh, profiling themselves as sustainability leaders is, is excellent for a brand. We all know the dangers of greenwashing, <laughs> but if they can be pro proved to be a legitimate uh, brand of integrity, uh, this will have uh, uh, very positive financial impacts. And, uh, you know, business experts also say that sustainability, strategy, vision, uh, innovation, transparency, these are all markers of the successful business in the next decade and beyond. So sustainability now is, is now integrated to be part of like a leading business strategy. And this is on the positive side. Also on the positive side, I just wanted to mention the B Corps again, and also uh, this initiative called the Fourth Sector Group. So the B Corps, um, Arthur mentioned in passing, there, there are now 3,500 of them in 70 countries around the world. So it's an idea that's really catching fire and spreading. However, 3,500 uh, 3, uh, companies is still very far from what we need. But the B Corp uh, businesses, they uh, have verified social environmental performance, public transfer, uh, transparency, and legal accountability to balance profit and purpose. So they're 
their their goal is really to change global business culture to redefine success in business not just shareholder value, but uh, accountability to all stakeholders. The fourth sector group I'll just mention really briefly because I think that's a very, very interesting initiative and it also hopefully will gather steam and gain in strength. And the, the goal of the fourth sector uh, group is, is somewhat similar to the B Corp movement um, to be a driver of using me uh, market economics, market-based approaches of the private sector to drive social and environmental aims of public and nonprofit sectors. So it's not just government, uh, nonprofit or private, it's a new sector using market-based tools to really accelerate social change for all those interdependent sustainable development uh, and human and social goals. So those are excellent business-driven movements, um, but we need still regulation, much more regulation, um, and at the global level, as Arthur was was highlighting. And just I'll, I'll I'll finish in you know talking a little bit about the gender equality piece because we are at the CSW and SDG four, of course, is 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 prominent. Um, and I've been very interested recently in reading research about um, how more women in leadership positions in countries lead to better environmental policies. For example, uh, if, if there's a higher proportion of women in, in parliaments or an equivalent body in, in a country, they are more likely to ratify environmental, uh, international environmental treaties, more likely to create protected land areas, uh, tend to have stricter climate change policies, this is also another interesting studies, study. Researchers found that a 10% increase in female parliamentarians was associated with a 0.24 metric ton decrease in carbon dioxide emissions per capita. So this is very interesting research. And of course, in, um, in the business sector, we've seen sort of similar uh, sort of trends if you have uh, more women in leadership. So, Again, this shows how indivisible the SDGs are, how important the gender component is, and women in leadership and decision-making positions and capacities. And this should be a key piece, of course, of the sustainability agenda for businesses also, not to lose sight of that. So I'll stop there with my brief comments, Wendy. Thank you so much, Maya. Um, and you know, thank you for also giving the other the, the positive things that are happening in the world and the, um, you know, the like minded organizations that are putting things forward, you know, for us. I think it's a really that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Sure. Now going to turn yes. to our um, oh, to Safa Sadek. Safa is um, one of the Young Women's Alliance. It's um, part of the National Alliance of Women's Organizations. You're at Stroud High School, I think? Yeah. And what do you? what is your particular focus of study there, Safa? I'm currently doing A-levels, so I'm taking English Literature, Business and Philosophy and Athletics. So this is why she's with us here today. And uh, over to you, Safa. Uh, I'd like to thank our event sponsor, EBBF, and Dr. Wendy Moman for inviting me to speak today. Uh, I would like to share with you my belief in how businesses engaging with the SDGs are a powerful and effective strategy for improving our planet and making society a better place. Did you know 86% of millennials consider it a top priority to work for a business that conducts itself ethically and responsibly? In fact, most millennials would be willing to take a considerable pay cut to work for such a business. This highlights the importance of businesses being ethical and sustainable and how much it can affect not only consumers but employers too. In the bigger picture, balancing profit with purpose has a positive effect on the world and creates an achievable path to transforming society for the better. In this COVID climate, we are beginning to understand just how interconnected we are and realise that life, society and our economic system are fragile and deeply volatile. But our generation that is connected and informed on the political, social and environmental movements that shake our world. Um, activists like Greta Thunberg, the powerful Black Lives Movement and the recent talks about violence against women in the UK are just some examples of this. Movements that have harnessed the power of social media to make their causes seen, heard and acted upon. Speaking out and standing up is now an inherent part of our culture. In a survey, 75% of Gen Zs said being politically or socially engaged is crucial to their identity. 
In light of this, there is pressure and an expectation for businesses to integrate these movements into their, into their values and practices illustrating the power of choice for individual consumer. This purchasing power allows you or I to buy a product, not only because of how great the product is, but because the brand aligns with our values. Businesses now understand that holding sustainable development as a business value is crucial for their reputation. An example of an organization spearheading the, the movement for sustainable development in business is B Corporation. They are an organization that certifies companies as having the highest standards of social and environmental performance, public transparency and legal accountability. Companies enter a process of assessment created with the SDGs in mind and, and if successful, they are certified as a B Corp, a label that is becoming more and more prestigious. With 3,720 companies and 150 industries in 74 countries, all with a common unifying goal to redefine business, they demonstrate that it isn't what you do, but it's the way you do it. B Corps don't just stop at certificates though, they are a community that meet regularly and share information and advice on how to continue powering the movement. One of my favourite forward-thinking B Corps is Innocent Drinks, and not just because I love their smoothie, smoothies, but because sustainability is at the core of their values. As well as improving agriculture by improving farming and reducing carbon emissions, they are tackling hunger through the Innocent Foundation. One of their projects, Drinks for the Homeless, works with Fair Share to give excess stock to those in need. Innocent have grasped what their role is in improving society and are actively doing so and illustrating their capacity for businesses to strive for much more than just profit. Furthermore, Innocent have shown clear engagement with the 2nd and 13th SDG to end hunger and take climate action. The work of social enterprises in driving sustainable development in business is also important to highlight here. Dissimilar from Innocent, who are balancing their profit with purpose, social enterprises are created with a social or environmental cause in mind and develop products and services to tackle these directly. Of late, the fashion industry has been under increased scrutiny for its long history of unethical and unsustainable practice. As a consumer who has a great interest in fashion, I'm consciously looking to improve my buying habits. White Knife is an Indian social enterprise that strives to be a pioneer in sustainable fashion by positively impacting the environment and society. They are an ethical gifting pro platform that empowers rural women and survivors of sex trafficking by supporting skills development and encouraging girls education. This is done through providing and paying for education and careers. They have even introduced an exclusive patent mineral called ELF, which is 89% like the original elephant ivory. This is revolutionary as research estimates that the number of elephants killed for their ivory between 2010 and 2012 was 100,000. In developing this alternative, White and I are committing to the 15th SDG, Life on Land, and showing a commitment to protect it. Additionally, White and I donates a portion of profits to the underprivileged, yet again engaging with another SDG, reducing inequality. White Knife really resonated with me as it targets so many of the SDGs and is Asia's first ever platform for ethical and sustainable fashion. White Knife are rewriting the narrative around Asia's prolific sweatshop industries and showing that ethical and sustainable fashion along with safe, fair and legal working conditions can be a reality. Being Asian myself, White Knife's story really resonated with me and I am inspired by the work they are doing for Asian women and their communities. I would like to end with this thought in mind. Business is one of our biggest assets in achieving the sustainable development goals. When you put responsibility on companies to operate with a conscience, the consumer is given the power to drive change. I wholeheartedly believe in the scope of this movement that continues to transform business and society for the better. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Safa. We really appreciated that. And, um, it was interesting that we've three of our speakers have all mentioned B Corps as well as a as a model um, to be looking at and and for co corporations to follow and business to follow. So it's it's interesting that uh, you know we do have some positive models as you've suggested there, and also looking at the way forward, especially for younger people and for girls. It's great. Thank you so much. So I'd now like to introduce our our next speaker, our last speaker, and that is Fiona Young. Um, Fiona is a UK qualified solicitor and head of the employment team at Inst Gibraltar. Having worked originally in the city of London, 
She and her husband moved to Gibraltar in 2003, where she continued to practice tribunal advocacy and litigation until 2015, when she trained as a mediator. In 2016, she completed a diploma in international commercial dispute resolution. When the government of Gibraltar introduced employment mediation for tribunal cases, Fiona became the first appointed tribunal mediator. She is a board member of the Gibraltar Federation of Small Businesses and an active member of their Women in Enterprise Policy Group. This provides advice, assistance, and networking opportunities for professional women. She was recently appointed to the Board of Governors of Townsend International School, a Baha'i-inspired school promoting moral and ethical as well as academic excellence in its students. She has also recently been voted chair of the <clears throat> Bright Med Forward Credit Committee, a Gibraltar-based charitable in initiative in which companies and individuals can donate or lend microloans to businesses financially impacted by COVID. In her spare time, she uh, conducts a youth choir in Gibraltar, which is called Joyful Riot, and it uses music to promote unity and positivity. So thank you, Fiona, for being with us from Gibraltar today. Thank you, and thanks to um, all the other speakers, and thanks to Safa, that was so inspiring. And um, it's going to speak to some of what I'm going to talk about as well. So the, the point you made about where millennials want to work, where our next, next generation of um, employees are coming from is really, really relevant to the sorts of business values that the commercial world needs to be thinking about. So, and thank you, Wendy. Um, yeah, so we're busy over here in Gibraltar. Uh, we get a lot of opportunity. It's a, a small community. So we get a lot of opportunity to focus on uh, business development and the ethics of business development here. And as, um, as Wendy said, I started my professional life as a litigator. Um, and uh, litigation by its nature is a very um, adversarial process. Um, and I spent 15 years pretty much embroiled in, in sort of quite hard nosed litigation as a day job. Um, and what I started to find really in handling these cases for, for my clients was there was a very, very clear pattern of how the cases ended up with my firm or on my desk or in the court. And this was where parties had an initial dispute, their communication broke down very rapidly. They turned to other people to facilitate that communication for them, usually lawyers. The process then became focused on point scoring and trying to win and going for the win. And um, you'd eventually, if you didn't resolve it through the lawyers um, sort of uh, forcefully persuading one another uh, to, to let go, you would end up in a court and um, a judge would decide for you. And what I always used to find and what I used to tell my clients time and time again is there is no Hollywood punch the air moment in this process. There is just deflation, uh, sadness, frustration that the judge didn't really understand you, didn't give you enough floor time, uh, the frustration that your lawyer ends up with more money than you end up in your in your compensation or in your outcome, um, and enormous amount of frustration if, if you don't succeed. And it's a, a process that's very much based on, on the survival of the fittest, who can shout loudest, who has the best means to be able to pursue this. And after uh, 15 years of, of sort of working within this, I decided it didn't comply with my personal and spiritual ethical values, particularly as a Baha'i, um, and I wasn't finding it very comfortable. But more aside from that, I was just seeing a pattern, because I dealt with these all the time, that the parties just needed to communicate better. So um, I looked around for something else and I found that there happened to be this incredible process called mediation. And uh, my mediation trainer was horrified that he had a lawyer because he said, oh, I'm gonna have to unteach you. 
um, which was absolutely correct. He had to totally unteach me. He had to teach me how to listen properly because how lawyers listen is we, we don't listen actually. We're formulating very, very quick quips and responses to whatever it is we're hearing. Uh, we're trained to do that. So we're actually trained to listen to disentangle and disengage. So I had to be, be um, trained to listen actively in order to fully engage. I had to learn to reframe. So reframing is, is taking a concept and, and turning it into a positive. Um, I was learning to take people's very ensconced positions. That's what we take into court. We take our very, very firm position and we keep bounding on about that position until someone agrees with us. We had to leave those at the door and we were looking at interest. So we're looking at aligning interests and seeing how we can find the parties, the opportunity to align their interests. And then instead of looking at this sort of adversarial debate style format, we were looking at consultation and collaborative discussion around a table and brainstorming solutions for a positive outcome. And the idea in all of this was to, if possible, maintain that professional or personal relationship so that the two people or the parties in Broad and the Dispute didn't lose that very valuable relationship that they'd worked on for years and years, um, that they each came away feeling they part participated in the solution themselves and that they also um, felt that they'd agreed on an outcome that they could both, we used to say it was a win-win and, and happy, happy, but actually when you actually uh, work in mediation, I think uh, Nikki will know this from her experience, it's equally as unhappy as the other. That's what we're aiming for. We're aiming at everyone walking out there is equally as unhappy as the other. And if you get that, you've, you've had a good day in the mediation room. So where does this tie in? With our sustainable development goals, where does this tie in with sustainable business development values? Well, again, I mean, we've all been talking about how those amazing 17 um, sustainable development goals interlink. And there are so many of those that are communication necessary and that to have a strong framework and foundation of discourse in trying to persuade those who are uh, perhaps not meeting their goals, you're going to need that framework of discourse. That's the first element. And then, as Wendy said, my key area is employment, originally employment litigator and now an employment mediator. And when we're looking at building businesses that are going to meet all 17 of these goals, including being businesses that Safa and her friends are going to want to come to work through, work to, we need to make sure that health and well-being, one of the sustainable development goals is absolutely paramount amongst businesses in terms of your staff and who it is that you're um, uh, providing employment to so that that also then ticks the boxes of the economic sort of prosperity and ensuring that we're now um, helping to provide environments in which people are able to work and able to work. Inclusion is another massive one. Um, what, you know, I mean, it's, it's becoming, for those of us that are in this world, it's just becoming second nature to pull off all of the reasons why 50 50 um, gender equality in leadership positions is so much more beneficial for businesses and for society, society as a whole. And there's a real push towards um, ensuring that you've got this diversity inclusion within your businesses and as a framework. And, you know, again, as the next generation coming through, they're going to be expecting that either as consumers or as um, working for that. So th those are the sort of basic foundations of interconnecting our sustainable development goals in terms of our business values. But the discourse is the most important and most essential point to how we are going to, and I think this sort of feeds back to, to Arthur's original point, how we are going to persuade organizations to rethink. And it then also links in, it's lucky, it's good to go last because you can link into everybody else's. It also links into Maya's point that she made about how actually it is big business that actually ends up um, really dictating governmental policies at the end of the day because they have the profit and the money to be able to lobby and to be able to bring about the change that they need to, to prosper. And in the past, that's been a very, very negative and very bad for the environment and very bad for certain groups of people, the way in which it's been done. And that, I feel, has also been based on this litigious and adversarial and dare I say it quite patriarchal um, and rooted in a very sort of um, dominant and forceful uh, behaviors that uh, everybody has learned and therefore everybody feels is the only way you're going to implement change because that's all anyone's ever seen. 
And what women leaders are now showing, certainly um, at governmental level, um, and I think one of the stats is that of the 22 women leaders that are in the world, their COVID responses have been absolutely phenomenal because they've based it on a completely different set of standards and values. Their first value was what is going to be needed for the well-being of my community that I am, I am caring for. Whereas a more male-oriented leadership focused very much on economy and on the economics of our community first. And so we've seen that misbalance. So having that diversity and awareness in the discourse and that total rechange and that total rethink of culture is going to be essential in feeding these business values into society in terms of ensuring that society is changing its whole chip in the way we even discuss sustainable development, in the way we even, as Safa said, make the demands of the places that we're going to work or of the uh, products that we're going to, to buy. It's the discourse and the way in which it's engaged in that is going to fundamentally facilitate this absolutely essential and urgent rethink that we're all facing. Um, and really, it comes back down to the process that I learned, which is thinking listening, really, really listening to the needs and listening to engage. So going back into our indigenous communities and hearing what it is and listening to what it is they've known that we've forgotten, that is an important representation at the table. Um, listening to what the female leaders can bring into the organization uh, and, and into the discourse, listening to what our younger generations have and then looking at brainstorms, looking at how we're going to have different thoughts and processes. This is going to be a rocky road. This is going to be a difficult discourse. We have a lot of unraveling to do and people are not comfortable with unraveling, particularly when it's gonna cost them. And so that discourse needs to be diplomatic and engaging and facilitating the various different needs of the community, that, the global community that we're addressing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona, for um, for that really interesting. Uh, first of all, your your own history as uh, you know, moving from one sector to another in that way, but also bringing in the sustainable development goals in such a, a cogent way. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, our our discussant today is Ellie Hollingworth. Um, wave your hand there, Ellie, and. She's going to be asking some questions herself, but anybody else, if you'd like to ask a question, just put your hand up. If you know how to use your blue hand, please do use it. Otherwise, I'll try to make a list. So Ellie, do you want to kick us off with the questions, please? To be honest with you, I'm not sure I have many questions because it was so eloquently put by all our speakers. Um, but I guess if if I can, perhaps some reflection might be sure. Might be Absolutely useful. great. Yeah. Um, firstly, I'd just like to say I'm so proud to hear Safa speak and, and represent uh, young people in this discussion, because I think like many of the topics that will be covered at CSW, it's really important to get our perspective, get us involved in conversations. And even in, sen in the sense of business, we may not have you know, business experience per se, but that's gonna be our future. And these are the uh, industries that hopefully we'll find ourselves in at some point in the future. Um, I think from my personal perspective, um, what Fiona touched on really resonated with me. Um, to do with employment, because that's where I find myself at the moment. I am a recent graduate and I entered the job market in March of 2020, which is possibly the worst time in history to have joined the job market, as I'm sure we'll all agree. Um, but I think it's a real journey for me and understanding you know, where, where I fit in the world and what, what I'm suited to. I did international development at university, so I'm very much, um, you know, in line with the SDGs and very interested in them. And I studied them for a long time. And uh, I came out to the job market with little to no uh, opportunities there. But I think having that time to reflect and being forced into reflection really made me understand what I'm looking for in an employer. And I think that's, as we've, as we've, as we've discussed with the other speakers, I think that's becoming more and more of a movement and more of what people are demanding in the job market. And I think it's really important for businesses to understand that 
yes, we need jobs and yes, we need you, but actually you need to assess us as candidates in a different way. You know, are these people, do these candidates, sorry, have uh, an alignment of goals? Do they have an alignment of values? It's not just who can do the best job the quickest, it's who's going to do it and care about it and going to make it their mission and can dedicate themselves to it. And that's that's where I'm at. And I think, um, you know, for all of the trouble that COVID, you know, I'm very fortunate, but, you know, for that struggle and trying to find a job and getting bombarded with rejection, actually having that time to reflect and understand that there are certain things that I, I want in, in an employer, you know, and if I had a dime for the amount of times I heard someone say to me it's a numbers game just apply for anything because it's so volatile at the moment and you just need to get into a job and I think actually I would ra way rather know that I'm in, a, in an organization that cares about me as a, as a person and is going to be able to support my development and and all of those sorts of things so yeah I guess not many questions, but I hope it's a conversation starter and I'm looking forward to, to, to discussing with all of, all of you guys. And thank you to our speakers. Very inspirational to hear all of you speak. Thanks so much, Ellie. Thanks for that great uh, input there. And I should have said uh, right at the beginning that Ellie is the person who designed um, uh, the, <sighs> uh, <laughs> the invitation, the, um, the WhatsApp, uh, all thing that we were sending around uh, the, the poster or flyer or whatever we're calling it and she was I should she was doing it at the 11th hour because we were trying to get yeah. all of our information to her and she's done a whole host of them for the I should uh, mention, CSW Alliance. <laughs> I only learned how to do it a few days ago so don't don't be fooled by that graphic design it, it very much was a skill I adopted last week. <laughs> so another COVID skill learned and put there on the go. CV. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I'll open it up now for discussion and other comments if anybody would like to say anything themselves. We thought we might break into groups but I think probably it's a small enough group that we can just um, stay here. So I don't know if anyone has um, an observation that they'd like to make or if Fiona wanted to come back. I just wanted to thank you. I just wanted to speak to Ellie's point because it's really, really relevant and stick to your guns, Ellie, because what I'm seeing and, and I get a really good visual on it is there is clear correlation between a, an organization that cares, that has uh, things like unconscious bias training, diversity inclusion um, commitments, has uh, what we call CSR, which is corporate social responsibility, and the way in which they treat their employees. So it's, it's absolutely a no brainer that, you know, nowadays you're well versed enough to be able to look at an organization. And it, you know, in my day, we didn't have that information. We had big names. I mean, it was get into the big name law firm. Um, and it, actually I'm now working with one of the big name law firms. INTS is a, you know, about 150 years old and it's a, a shipping firm. It has a big problem with, with diversity and inclusion. It's got an all white, all male board and they're being absolutely holed over the calls by, by the likes of me and, and my cohorts for, to change that. Um, and they have issues in terms of staff retention. They have issues in terms of um, uh, just uh, different people's relationships. We're trying to work on it and build it, but it, it's going to take a long time to help them change that culture. And it's affecting their share price. It's as simple as that because there's visuals on it. So absolutely 100% when you're looking to go and work somewhere, ensure that it has these core values because you're going to have a much better experience. You're going to work with much nicer people and you're going to be treated much better. Thanks, Fiona. Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, Pauline Stewart, you are also in the world of ethical business. Maybe you could make a couple of comments. Yeah, thanks, Wendy. Um, yeah, sorry, I came in a little bit late, but I, I got the grasp of everything and everywhere we're going. And um, I'm actually going to share something with you, because whilst I've been sitting here listening to everyone, um, I think we all come into the world and particularly into the groups that and the people that I know will be on this forum. And for me, it's very much about, you know, doing the whole thing and the ethical business and flying the flag and in support of women and all other great and good things that have emerged this year. But also that we work hand in hand with great people, great guys as well, that support some of the work we do ethically. And I was just thinking about um, a little something that's gone on in the past year, very close to me and very personal, um, in including my son. 
And um, uh, Wendy will know a bit of it, so I won't go into war and peace on it, but I can tell you that the organisation he works for, I have never, ever known anything like it, apart from, as Safia was saying, the, the lovely, um, the innocent drinks, uh, the virgin Atlantics of this world that I know some insight into. But this organisation is a South African organisation, and they actually say it's about the people. It's very, very ethical, and they walk this talk of it's about the people and my son who had come into a personal bit of a battle for the for the last few months and continues to be in a battle i can tell you that they have called him in the evening they have put money after mediators so fiona will really respect that i think that they've actually done that on his behalf they've actually said you're tired you mean more to us than the business so we need to look after you because our motto is that first we must serve our people and our family. And when you hear of those organisations, and I am going to give it a shout out, a South African organisation uh, in marketing called Barrows, um, and they have done exactly that. And when I hear of these organisations, in particular for Ellie, when you're thinking about, yeah, you, you just hold on because sometimes getting to the place of working with ethical people and being around them, my goodness, it's let me tell you, that's not that easy. There is a real hard work out there where people go, well, you could join us for this, Pauline. The amount of money I have turned away because I know those people are not ethical. Please don't hear me say I'm wealthy, ladies, because I am not, and gents, because I am not. But my value system, my ethical system is I would rather work with the people that value the people. Um, I'm in leadership and development. Why would I go in for that advancement if I haven't got the organisation truly behind me to help when I've developed those people? So, you know, I, I think that the ethical drive is very much now we're seeing there's lots of things that merging, not so many nicest things that are coming up on our news and on our media. And we now there is a real there is a real real wind of change coming here and you can feel it. And I think for those of us that walk that journey of being ethical and have those lovely values behind us, in particular, some of I'm not a Baha'i, but I know quite a lot from Wendy and I, I do pick up a lot of those values and try to bring them into my life. If you walk that path, I think you'll all get what you you truly want, but it would probably be hard work, but it's nice to know that we're going towards it. So Wendy, I hope that kind of supports where you were thinking, but they are out there, those organisations, and most importantly, I think for any of you that are setting up new businesses or wanting to set up, let's try and perhaps use the framework of those organisations, albeit we might be a lot smaller, to frame our own companies in that way and, and do great and good things. Thanks, Pauline. That's really great. And, you know, that whole idea of, you know, when you're even setting up your own business to start from that base is a really, really great one. And it seems to come um, into what Fiona was also saying about the kind of diversity that's required. So it's not just women's leadership, but it's the people who support women as well, the men who support them. And, you know, we're working towards a, a more equal, accessible, prosperous, sustainable society for everyone, not just for certain sectors. So that's really helpful as well. Zarin, I don't know if you'd like to say a few words here as well. Zarin is the director of the National Alliance of Women's Organizations and forms the main secretariat for the UK Civil Society Women's Alliance. And, and um, she's a really hardworking person. <laughs> so if you've got, if you've got two seconds to uh, <laughs> to help us out here um yeah i'm just trying to i was just reflecting on what, what i might want to say um i haven't really f formulated anything really but one of the interesting things i think is that um some of the un statistics is that there are the majority of the world's population are employed by small businesses and the majority of micro and small businesses are owned by women so which is an interesting um uh way of looking at things and, and why it is that so many women start up businesses. Now, in some parts of the world, for example, in North America and Europe, it could be that they are, they are fed up with the strains and politics of working in other corporations, but also because they want to have, the, they want to be able to manage their time as carers, because women are still in the position of being predominantly the carers in the world. And so it, it's a way of managing time. Uh, with your family concerns as well as trying to earn a living as well as developing your own creativity and and uh, entrepreneurship in other parts of the world it's it's oftentimes women are forced to be 
in entrepreneurship because the other systems that would provide for them don't exist. Um, but you find that it's, it's a real also an opportunity for empowerment when you have women entrepreneurs and a lot of organizations that help to um, enhance and build capacity of often disadvantaged women is through helping them to become entrepreneurs by giving them seed funding and then helping them to become entrepreneurs. And, I, and it's, it was interesting listening to what Maya said about how there seems to be a, a correlation between the women who are in power and the amount of green policies that are put in place. And there is also a relationship between women entrepreneurs and sustainable development, it seems. So I think these are, there, there are so many interesting relationships between um, goal five, of course, for the, of the SDGs, the other targets, for, uh, gender targets within the SDGs and, and business. And the more that uh, businesses develop so-called female qualities, it seems the better they become. And if you think in the past, there was this idea that you had, in order to succeed as a business, you have to be hard and harsh. And some of the kind of qualities that are supposedly masculine, the masculine qualities, you know, kind of thriving and thrusting and pushy and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And to have the kind of the softer qualities, which is all about, you know, and actually in leadership, they're called soft qualities, the soft skills, the idea of collaboration, communication, um, empathy, you know, working, working well with each other, et cetera. Uh, were not thought to be necessary in business and actually there's been a huge turnaround in business and it seems to be the case that, that it's really begun to be understood sort of at the highest levels anyway that these qualities which are the so-called feminine qualities are essential in business leaders and in business management if you are to enable the most important element of your company which is your social capital which is your people and so it seems to be there's a, the, the more there is a feminization of business the more there is a development of business and that's also related to sustainable development. So it's a very interesting topic for this session because it's about ensuring that, um, you know, as Fiona mentioned about um, corporate social responsibility, it shouldn't just be a chapter in the annual report. It's got to be something that is key, fundamental core to the way a business works. And the more businesses work in that way, in fact, the more produ productive they become. Thanks so much, um, Zarin, for that. And um, uh, did you want to also just mention the uh, advance um, upcoming? Um, yeah, well, our, <laughs> so very, Wendy and I are also involved in another event for CSW, which is organized by Advance. And that the subject of that event is the role of women entrepreneurs in sustainable development. And I have to look at my paper to see what it is. Yes, so it is the 19th. Um, at 12.30. So you're most welcome to come to that too and to continue the conversation. Thank you, Wendy, for that um, advert. Thanks very much, Zarin. Um, the other thing, I, I, Mara, I, I only um, was able to have Maya for one hour and I think, Arthur, you might be in the same situation. Are you having to leave yourself, Arthur? Not quite. The next event is at 5.30 and then there's another one at, at 7 o'clock. So I have a whole series of things one after the other but I could for the moment I can I can hang around for a while it's more very good the excellent did you have anything you wanted to add <laughs> do well, add just, now was, if you'd I like to say anything. in terms of you know I come from perhaps an earlier generation but I know that I often had to choose working with difficult bosses in well because I felt the job I could do was of service to society and therefore I felt that you know I could I could live my values through through being of service, through contributing through my science or through my environmental work, whatever, even if it meant dealing with you know a leader who lied to me and uh, tried to fire me when it was totally unjustified, or you know things of that sort that happened to me several times in my career, and I simply, you know, in sense, when, when one case I was considered deadwood because I was doing nine full-time jobs and they couldn't believe I could do that and therefore I must be deadwood, and so they were going to terminate me just before I was going to retire. And then at the last minute, they gave me another responsibility. So I raised $12 million in, in, in one year to say, yeah, yeah, Deadwood, this is what Deadwood can do. <laughs> you have your own way of getting, getting, getting vengeance for being badly treated, which is by performing so well that they have to change their mind. 
So it's, there are different ways of living your values in these contexts. And to say now there's much more sensitivity to these things than there were 20, 30, 40 years ago when I was facing some of these challenges. But I think all of this is part of saying, how can you, you know, plan a life in which you, you, you don't look back and say, I regret doing that, I was unhappy doing that. There was something that's a positive to outweigh whatever negative things were, were, were the other parts of you know, having to live in, the, in this world of today. Thank you. Thanks, Arthur. That's helpful. I'm going to call Nikki in a moment, but I just wanted to remind, uh, Arthur will remember one of our um, EBVF members who, who joined EBVF as a young person and rose to being a C CEOs of quite outstanding companies. Um, used to say, you know, he used to have this little game that he played at our EBBF when we met face to face, which was to say, how many people would like to work for an ethical, wonderful, caring, environmentally friendly, did a little, uh, you know, uh, organization and everybody would, you know, stand on this side and everybody would go there and he said, how many people would like to work for a poisonous, negative, hateful, you know, un uninspiring organization? And he would be standing alone on the other side. And he said, I chose this because here's where I can make a major difference, is to join that sort of a, a company. So Nikki, please. Yeah, I, I just have a question. It was mentioned that I think you said there were 3,500 of these organizations that are really building on ethical um, standards. And I'm really curious to know where the change is coming from, whether it's a top down or bottom up. So is it coming from the top where companies and organizations are recognizing that the movement of society is one that recognizes the need for sustainability and ethical standards? And so they're sort of reactionary and moving in that direction as a result, really realizing that in order to stay afloat, they have to kind of move with the tide. Or is it really coming from younger people who have different perspectives and who have this sort of knowledge and understanding of that need who are coming into the workforce and moving up into the workforce and moving into these leadership positions and that are really kind of moving the chain? Uh, Safa, did you wanna to try to answer that one? You're still muted, um, Safa. Sorry. Um, I'm not really sure what to say. Could um, you repeat the question, please? Yeah, I, I'm just trying to understand where this change is. It was mentioned that many, that there are 3,500 organizations moving more toward this sort of ethical practices. And I'm trying to understand where this change is coming from, whether it's coming from the top, as these organizations begin to realize that they have to move with society's changes. And, and as society becomes more conscious of the, of the need, they're reacting to that and making changes in the ethical direction to stay afloat. Or if it's really coming from the bottom up, people moving into those leadership roles who have a better understanding, whether it's more women entering the workforce and coming into those leadership roles that is really affecting the change. I, I'm trying to get a better understanding of where this change is coming from, both from the top down and the bottom up, or if there's really sort of a bent in one direction or the other. Um, well, I feel like it's next. Oh, sorry. I feel like- No, it's just because you mentioned B Corps, that's all that we were thinking about. Yeah, I feel like it's a mixture between the two, to be honest. Um, with like B Corp, um, like constantly like moving forward, I feel like there's just a re realizing that if they are B Corp certified, they are more likely to, um, you know, do well because people are trusting in it and it's just like ethical. Um, and then I feel like a reason that um so much of it like sustainability is developing is because of like social media and just because people are realizing the importance of ethicality and so um the like um I just people are being more like aware of it and so I feel like they're conscious that they need to make a change but also just like from like people coming into um businesses and like um females coming into businesses yeah I feel like it's a mixture between the two I, I would also echo that, Safa. I think it's a combination of the two. Um, <clears throat> and also that businesses have to respond now. There, there is a sort of 
sense of responsibility to respond to the the outer context so things that Safa mentioned in her speech about Black Lives Matter you know and the the climate crisis and you know there's a whole plethora of those things but um there is a real cultural demand for it I think but there is also the idea that the, the new emerging workforce wants that in a business. But I think the B Corp movement is really interesting to talk about because they are spearheading this. And the amazing thing about them is that they are a movement. You know, they're not just a charity organization. They are putting things out, they're putting resources out. They're getting these B corporations to move, like meet. And it's, it's an educational community that they're sharing all of this advice and moving towards, you know, strengthening the movement and, and adopting it in other areas of the world. So I think, I think to answer your question, a combination of the two, but perhaps, you know, a lot of these small, these SMEs are, are more uh, responsible for that shift than perhaps bigger corporations. I would say, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm right there, but I, I would think that the larger corporations are responding to, to the pressure, whereas the SMEs have, you know, in a lot of contexts been driving that change. So I think it's important as well to, to pose the question of how do we know when a business is truly operating, you know, in line with the SDGs, has a, has a true sort of value system that is in line with these and, and genuinely wants this. What's the difference between those those organizations and others that are perhaps performative? And, um, you know, I think I, I can't remember who said it, but putting it in the annual report at the end of the year or engaging in certain programs that are great for social corporate responsibility, but perhaps aren't that committal. They're, they're sort of a, a once a year, let's go and sort of work on a project, which is amazing. But is that is it enough? And I think we have to constantly ask ourselves, how committed really are you to, you know, being a business, providing a product, providing a service that has real, you know, powerful change and impact? Thanks, Ellie. I saw Zarin's hand. Did I see an, another hand up as well? Is there somebody else? Zarin, do you want to comment on that too? I was going to say the same thing that they've said, actually, which is it seems to be a you know, and as I think um, Pauline said earlier on, there, there does seem to be a real shift in thinking and movement in terms of business that they're that from the top down, you know, there, there is a vision of businesses that actually to be more productive, they need to be to be different. I, and uh, Richard Branson wrote a book which had a rather rude title, which I can't remember now, but it was all, and uh, it was about businesses and needing to be different. And I went to a, a, a global leaders conference in Brussels a few years ago, and the, the head of um, um, I can't remember, of Siemens, I think, was there, and they'd had a, a very bad history of they'd been found out for doing corruption, and then they decided to have a zero tolerance for corruption. And since they did that, they had a thirty-three percent shift in productivity, increase in productivity. So it seems that there is an understanding from from companies that actually this is the way forward. That that be doing doing good means that you also do well and that there's a link between them and they need to do that and at the same time there is increasing awareness from younger generations there's a, you know if you look at the different generations what they what their aspirations are, are in terms of work there's a difference and the advertising industry has recognized this so you only have to look at adverts to see how adverts have changed the adverts are now all about community you know you buy a phone and it's about communities nappies is about community it doesn't matter what it is advertising has shifted to recognize that you that people are not buying things according to brand anymore they're buying things to the extent to which they accord with their values and their dreams and their aspirations so this new the new generation of people going into work now are doing exactly what ellie is doing which is um saying that actually they, they're thinking about who do they want to work for and they no longer just to work, want to work for any old company as long as it gets some money people are beginning to realize it's a, it's a post-materialistic society that there's other ways of doing things. So there seems to be the shift and it seems to be coming from, you know, both, uh, both the top and the bottom. Thanks, Serene. Jake, I, we haven't heard your voice. Would you like to comment on this at all? Any of these aspects? Nothing? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I, I can very I can very quickly pitch in. Um, hi, um, I don't actually know a lot of people here, but uh, it's great to meet you all. I'm 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 Jake Bonetta, coming from the uh, 
lovely hills and fields of East Devon in in uh, England. Um, uh, I, I I found it quite interesting when um, Safa was talking about um, corporate social responsibility, actually, um, because my background in a lot of my work and community work specifically um, lies in um, food distribution. So I. I founded um, in November a, a food redistribution charity in my hometown um, and we give food away to approximately 100 households a week um, through this network and have partnered with nine supermarkets um, just in a small town. Um, and we have actually found that um, the easiest supermarkets to work with have been the ones with higher customer satisfaction. Um, I mean, I've just done a very, very quick search on Glassdoor, for example, and Waitrose is one of their top 50 um, companies for this year. And um, we partner with them and we, we, they, uh, they're very helpful and their staff are always very, very happy. So I think there definitely is a link between um, also not, not only just um, employee satisfaction and um, social responsibility, but also kind of the community links in there as well, I think. So the community does absolutely benefit if corporate social responsibility is improved and employee satisfaction. Yeah, that, that's pretty much all I had to say there. Thank you. Well, that's very significant. Thank you so much for that, for that uh, contribution. I don't know if anybody else had anything, um, uh, would like to also come in. Margaret Badley, are you a comment to make on this? You're muted at the moment. Okay. No, I've been very interested. And while I've been um, listening, I've been thinking about what's the likely impact of COVID and whether in fact some people, both people who've been out of work, as a lot of people have been this year, um, and whether and others will actually be flailing around looking for jobs and may have to at least temporarily um, move away from fields which would actually suit their ethical uh, interests and requirements and desires for some time. I'd be interested to know what other people think. It's a real conundrum. Thank you for bringing that up, Margaret. I don't know if anybody has got a, a view on that um, particularly. I know my own view is that, you know, um, different countries are managing this process very differently also. Uh, for those of you who are not in the UK, the government has um, been supporting people at work um, to a huge degree, 80% of their income for a whole year now. It's been a huge, a huge amount of money, which eventually we'll have to pay back somehow in taxes. Um, uh, people who have been furloughed and had that money um, they you know, extending things like, you know, more money to, to some kinds of businesses. Some of the businesses have really suffered arts and, uh, you know, public you know, hospitality industry and so forth. Um, but uh, for another, another parts of the world, of course, they've had different experiences of, of that um, a lack of lack of government support, perhaps for, for workers. So we've been very fortunate here in some ways in the UK. But my own feeling is that sometimes, um, you know, if you, sometimes you have to do things that you have to do, but it doesn't mean that that's going to be the pattern of your life. And you do have this opportunity when you're working to be the kind of employee you wish your employer was an employer, was that kind of employer. In other words, you can model uh, good behavior, ethical behavior, um, and I think EBBF is in that sort of position itself of trying to enable people across the spectrum of people who are at work to themselves reflect ethical values, ethical behaviors, and to, you know, enable others around them to do the same, even if the overall company at the board level is not of that mind, it still chips away at those ideas of power and uh, money, you know, simply having a profit at any cost, whether it harms the environment, harms people and so on. Uh, it's not ideal, but we still have the opportunity to ourselves behave 
in ethical ways. I see your hand, Ellie, next. Yeah, I was just going to respond to Margaret, actually. Um, I would agree, absolutely, Wendy, it is a conundrum. And obviously, I can only speak from my own, um, my own experiences of navigating the job market at the moment. Um, but what I think is worth mentioning is in this year long journey, <laughs> it's been now, you know, I have also applied for other things that weren't aligned to me and I didn't get them either. So I think that's where I got to where I thought, do you know what, <laughs> I may as well only apply for the things that I really want, because that's really how tough it is at the moment, you know, and I think what I would say is um, it hasn't been all doom and gloom. I have got further in certain jobs than I have in others. Um, and the ones that I have really got to the, you know, the sort of final stages and been, you know, snubbed, if you will, <laughs> have been the roles where I think that I have um, really been able to convey my values and really convey what my ambitions are. And it's been responded to really well. Granted, it hasn't landed me a job yet, but I've definitely noticed that the response has been a lot more um, successful for me. So I guess it's, it's obviously different in every context, but that's what I've found. Thanks so much, Ellie. I think it's this is going to be something we're just going to have to wait and see how it pans out. But I guess the other aspect of that is, you know, in encouraging each other as we as we go through this period. I think this is one of the things that we're learning. You know, some people have taken everything very, very badly, and it's been very harmful to them. Um, and we need to support each other in that, um, in their efforts to stay sane and connected, learning. Uh, it's not been that simple for many, many people. And I think the good, you know, one of the things we are learning is the value of good friends and good neighbors um, who, who keep an eye out for each other. And and our work colleagues where we have them to make sure that they are able to do the work that they're given, they're, su they're supported, if not financially in other ways that enable them to at least have a positive um, outlook on life. But it is a challenge. And you know, if it goes on much longer, there's going to be a lot, a lot of very discontented people, I think, in the world. But this is why we're trying with um, sessions like this to bring to people's attention the, the possibility of moving in a new direction and that the change is possible. And in fact, it's inevitable because we can't carry on the way we have been for decades and centuries previously with the old models. We have to um, move forward if we're going to survive as a species, never mind as individuals. Sari. Yeah, I think just one last thought um, before we finish, and that is that all of us have, you know, the opportunity to transform. Each of us has the opportunity to transform ourselves each day, each moment. And we have, we have choices. So we can choose what we buy. We can use the power of the consumer to, to use our purse appropriately. But we can also become entrepreneurs ourselves or be more entrepreneurial. And just like with sustainable development, we can really make a lot of choice about what we do in terms of what we eat and the pro things we buy and, and how we use plastic or whatever. There are, there are huge possibilities for us to make choices in our lives and to, to also influence the companies we work in. So if we are working in a, a company, then we need to be trying our best to change its policies. I decided when I was, I didn't actually decide it when I was university, but when I was at university, I started my first business. And I've never really been employed apart from a very small amount of time for a couple of months um, on POIE. But the rest of the time I've been, I never had a proper job, really. I've only been employed. And when I did try to get a proper job, when I was uh, coming out of having four kids and I wanted to get back, you know, I wanted to, to earn some money. And I applied for jobs. I couldn't get anywhere because I didn't have a proper CV because I've never been employed. Um, so, uh, but at the same time, it has been the place, it has been an opportunity to spend you know to, to to choose how you spend your time and it has given an immen immense freedom uh, the way i have done it is that i haven't been hugely financially rewarded but that was my choice in that i chose to spend my time on other things but it has given freedom and i think all of us have choices about how we spend our money and how we spend our time and we we just need to think about what our passions are and our priorities are and our ethics are and then just try to live according to those, whatever they are. 
And thank you, Wendy, and all the speakers for a great event. Well, thank you so much, Zarin. So I'm just going to ask the speakers, unfortunately, Maya had to leave. And it looks like Arthur is still there. Arthur, any last words from you? May not be there. <laughs> Fiona, would you like to say a last few words? I think it's been, I've really, really enjoyed listening to everybody. Um, and I think the, 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 the takeaway from this really is, um, you know, to, to focus on that, that change and that culture and that just um, standing true and firm knowing that this is the right direction that we need to be going in. I love this idea of wanting to be the one person in the in the totally toxic uh, organization. Ellie, go to a nice organization first, see how it's done, and then, you know, go in your entry level into the toxic organization. I wouldn't recommend a starter level toxic organization. Just That's just a bit of advice to the, the lovely Ellie. And also Safa, you know, amazing. You're just incredible. Just keep doing what you're doing. Really Really inspirational but thank you everybody thanks fiona um ellie uh, safa would you like to say a last few words um, i just want to say thank you for um allowing me to come to this event and speak at this event and um i really enjoyed this time to have speak to someone i want to say uh i hope to carry on being involved thanks safa and ellie is our discussant i know you've you've spoken just now but any last words for us I mean yeah just just the same really thank you so much for, for giving us the platform I think again for, for the youth to be involved is, is a really important thing and Fiona and our other speakers I thank you very much for, for all the personal advice you've given me I wasn't intending to uh <laughs> to use to use this event as a as a sort of yeah but it's it's worked out nicely so thank you <laughs> Thanks so much. Well, it's been great to have everybody here. Thank you so much for your participation. I hope that you'll be able to join one or two of the other events that are taking place uh, at the uh, Commission on the Status of Women. There are a number that are on their platform and if you haven't registered, you won't be able to participate. But if you, there are a number that are um, independent ones like this where we've, we've decided to open it up to a wider audience. And so if you'd like more information about that, you can just contact myself and um, or Zarian, if you got the, uh, the the WhatsApp group from uh, WhatsApp notice from her, and we can let you know the other events that are going on that you might be interested in across the whole range of um, interesting ideas that are being um, discussed by women and the men who support them at the CSW this year. So thank you all very much, and we'll see you at the next thing. <laughs>